my dad always got it. And I thought I oh, found good ones, but I don't think I did. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> good morning. This morning, our scriptures from Matthew, the third chapter. <clears throat> in those days, John the Baptist appeared in the desert of Judea, announcing, Change your hearts and lives. Here comes the kingdom of heaven. He was the one of whom Isaiah the prophet spoke when he said, The voice of one shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. John wore clothes made from camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. People from Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and all around the Jordan River came to him. As they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. Many Pharisees and Sadducees came to be baptized by John. He said to them, You children of snakes! Who warned you to escape from the angry judgment of this that is coming soon? Produce fruit that shows you have changed your hearts and lives. And don't even think about saying to yourselves, Abraham is our father. I tell you that God is able to raise up Abraham's children from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good food fruit will be chopped down and tossed into the fire. I baptize you with water, all of you who have changed your hearts and lives. The one who is coming after me is stronger than I am. I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The shovel he uses to sift the wheat from the husk in his hands. He will clean out the threshing area and bring the wheat into his barn, but he will burn the husk with a fire that can't be put out. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. Thank you, Jim. I have Junior Children's Church ready. Yeah. <laughs> well, how was your week? Oh boy, right? Fresh off of Thanksgiving and now making preparations for Christmas, right? <laughs> it seems as though December has caught us rather quickly. <laughs> and as we were just talking about, I hope that your week didn't have too many mountaintops or too many valleys but that you kind of were able to stay in between somewhere, uh, not too over the top, not too down in the dumps, but that you were able to stay in communication with God, that whatever you faced, he's with you. And we remember that, right? How many of us understand what Advent season is? Right? We, or at least we think we do. We know there's going to be and an odd number of purple candles and that one weird pink one. Uh, we, we, we know that, that somebody's going to get up and read some reading, and, and the pastor's going to try to make sure somehow he ties it all together with, with some kind of message or something. We, we know that there's Christmas trees involved, and uh, there's, there's all kinds of things that we know about Advent. We're going to hear, uh, maybe not in the exact order, but somewhere the words hope and peace and love and joy are, are going to be a part of this. And we're obviously going to have to hear over and over again about the birth of Jesus, right? We hear this over and over and over again. And one of the things that we often do at this time of year is we make sure that we read about the prophecies of Jesus. And what makes the prophecies of Jesus stand out so much is that it's unbelievable that they ever came true. It really is. Often we go to Isaiah, right? Because Isaiah talks a lot about the birth of a Savior, the coming of a Messiah, 
Uh, Isaiah is the one that, that we see talking more about uh, a virgin birth, all of these things. And this morning in the reading, let's see how I'm going to tie that together. This morning in the reading, we saw a different type of Isaiah in that he's talking about the branch line of David. And he's talking about how this Savior or the Messiah would be the Spirit of God shooting up out of the line of David and the Spirit of God would rest on this person. And Jesus was this person, but it goes much, much deeper than what we think. It, I, was, I, I did a lot of reading this week and learning uh, through the book that we have and, and through uh, all the other things that I was, I was trying to find more about prophecy and, and what the fulfillment is. So in order to get to David, you actually have to go all the way back to Abraham and Sarah. I know, weird, right? Hundreds of years even before, even before David, hundreds of years before prophecy is ever going to be written, right? You've got to have Abraham and Sarah. Sarah was 90 years old, 90, right? When God said, I am going to bless you with a child. Sarah, if you read scripture, Sarah laughed, just like Deb just did. <laughs> yeah, right. Sure enough, it happened. And not only did that happen, but God would make a promise to Abraham that nations of followers and believers in this God would come from Abraham. So you see in the very beginning, in the early stages of mankind, that Abraham is given this message that believers of God, nations of people, will come after him. Wow, that's pretty incredible, right? He makes that promise to Abraham, and, and yet we see then through Scripture that God keeps keeping his promises, right? He says he has 12 sons, right? Do you remember the stories? The Judah, his son Judah, is the one who then the line of David, David comes from the line of Judah. And David then has the line that contains Jesus. We often wonder why you call Jesus the line of Judah, right? He is from the line of Judah. And I know it sounds weird, but you also have to understand how many of us remember the one son, Joseph. There is a story that we often use for other purposes and see it for what it is in Joseph. His brothers sell him off into slavery, right? And we think, oh, that's so horrible. You know, they wanted to fake his death and threw him in a pit. And that wasn't going to work, so they... Saw these slave traders moving nearby. This is all part of the miracle, by the way. And they're like, hey, let's not leave him in this pit because somebody will find him someday. Let's sell him off. And we'll just say he was attacked and killed and, and we'll put blood on his robe, and, and right? Joseph then goes into slavery. He ends up in a place of authority where he has the storage capacity to avoid a famine. The 11 brothers then come to Joseph because they're dying of a famine. And Joseph says, I can help you. Now, if all of that had not taken place, all 12 of those sons likely would have died from the famine. Crazy, right? It's weird how God works. And if Joseph hadn't had all these horrible things happen to him. He wouldn't have been able to save his brothers. Therefore, Judah would not have been able to continue his line, which would have led to David, which would then lead us to Jesus. It's crazy, right? More than 680 years before Jesus' birth, God had told the prophet Isaiah that a Savior would have a virgin mother and would be God himself in flesh. 680 years. I saw somewhere this week where it was like, yeah, you're, you're as far from 2060 as you are from 1980. So it's something like that. It's not exact. But I'm like, carry the one. That's impossible. And that's only a few years. That's only like, what, 30, 40 years that we're talking about? 
And so 680 years. A lot can change in 680 years, right? 680 years. The accuracy of this one claim alone is miraculous. Especially given how many years the world would wait for the fruition of this promise. But that is only one of many prophecies. The one of 108 prophecies fulfilled in Jesus' birth and life. In 1958, a renowned mathematics and astronomy professor, Peter Stoner, studied and calculated the chances of fulfillment of messianic prophecies. His conclusion was that the probability of even eight of those 108 conservatively is one in 100 quadrillion. Now y'all got a better chance of winning the lottery than you do of having those prophecies come true. Right? And we know what that's like. In case I, I should find a way somehow to put it up in, in numbers because it looks ridiculous with all those zeros. One in 100 quadrillion. Just eight. Eight. That makes Christmas one of the most significant miracles in history. Right? You weren't literally sitting here celebrating something that had a one in 100, or a one in 100 quadrillion chance of happening based on prophecy. Wow. Jesus has come into this world, though, to bring it peace, right? And that's one of the things that the prophecy tells us. John the Baptist today, in today's text, is out in the desert, again, fulfilling another one of those prophecies. There will be a voice in the wilderness, right? <clears throat> the, John the Baptist is out in that wilderness telling everybody what's about to happen, telling everybody that's coming. He's actually fulfilling Isaiah 40, verse 3, and Jesus is the one who comes then after today's text to be baptized by John, fulfilling again the prophecy. They might have been frightened, the, you know, those Pharisees and Sadducees. John's laying it out for him, right? He's laying it out to the religious leaders. You guys better uh, figure this out because something's about to happen and you may not like it. Kind of a thing, right? I, I don't think we, we should avoid uh, the, the, the language and the visuals that, that John uses because Jesus is not coming to bring you peace the way you think. He's not coming to make everything okay. He's not coming to end all wars. He's not coming to end hunger. He's not coming to end uh, poverty. He's not coming to end racism. He's not coming to end any of those things. What he is coming to do is bring complete peace. Peace as shalom. Shalom is a peace that is about completeness, not about the absence of conflict and war. I mean, just him being Jesus riled people up so much that they crucified him. Wow. And yet the whole time, Jesus is like, hey, I'm here to bring peace. It may not look the way we want. Jesus makes broken things whole again. He brings dead things to life. Well, and one might think because that of Jesus, everything is going to be great, but yet he is going to still separate the chaff from the wheat, right? He is going to separate those things from us and in others that are not fulfilling what he came here to fulfill. The peace of Christmas is found in a better way. We've had a long 2021 as if we thought 2020 wasn't enough, 2021 seems to be progressively getting worse, right? Especially when it depends on who you're listening to. <laughs> I heard those chuckles. But what I see is something totally different. I've said it before, and I think I said it in one of those, pre in, the, in a previous message, that, that we, how, how 
naive and selfish of us to think that, oh, we are the ones that have it so bad. I mean, Jesus' day was horrifying. (laughs) Do not think I'd want to be around for that. Even the years after, the Crusades, oh my goodness, who would want to be around for that? But I think that what Jesus promises is fulfillment in God's word. He's bringing us to a place where we can rely on God's promises, even if it takes 680 years for us to see it. From Abraham to Sarah to Isaac to Joseph to Judah to David and finally to Jesus, it's all a story about God's promise kept. And like so many other promises that God makes, the result is not often quickly seen. I recounted uh, my, my visit, one of my visits with Dwight, in which he was talking about the surgery. I recounted that yesterday uh, to a group of young ladies who are about to embark on a chrysalis team. And I said, I remember Dwight's words because Dwight was having this very important very crucial surgery. He was going to have to go off of his medication, which means all of his, his muscles and his Parkinson's is going to just act just horribly upon his body. And he said, I remember crying out, oh, Jesus, I need you. Oh, Jesus, I need you. And he said, every time in the middle of that hurt, every time in the middle of that struggle, every time it was, it was too much and I cried out to Jesus, I wondered where he was because at the moment I didn't see him. It wasn't until afterwards when I could see every step and every moment of where he led me and helped me through that process. That child was not born thousands of years ago so that we would have pretty decorations and sit in a church and light strangely numbered candles Our Jesus was born so that Gentiles like us could be adopted into the family lineage and into the line of David, into the line of Judah, into the line of Abraham. Our Jesus makes it possible for our peace to be complete so that no matter what we're facing, we can accept our future and our present. Jesus' death and resurrection makes many things possible, but it definitely makes our eternity the most important. Thousands of years from now, people are going to be writing things and rereading things, and especially now that we have the internet, they're going to be watching things. How are they going to remember you? Are you going to be a voice in the desert fulfilling prophecy? Maybe you're going to be on the other side and you're going to be a Pharisee or Sadducee. What is it that God is going to fulfill in us now that we know that he's here with us? There is a better way. Amen. As we get ready and prepare.